Okay, so osmoregulation means basically regulating osmosis. And osmoregulation is basically a word for how organisms balance water. Because, remember, as we just spoke about, water, because of the aquaporins, can freely pass, for the most part, in and out of cells. Which means if a cell is not in an isotonic environment, an environment that has a, the same amount of water, um, similar amounts of solutes, what's going to tend to happen is either water's going to go in and the cell's going to swell, or water's going to go out and the cell's going to shrivel up. So there has to be some way of controlling the balance of water. Um, so a couple of these are just a few examples. So the paramecium is a protist, a single-celled organism. It lives in fresh water. That means that it is surrounded by a hypotonic solution because it would have more solutes in its cell than the water around it. So water is going to tend to go in. How does it prevent from swelling up and popping? It uses the contractile vacuole, which we actually talked a little bit about in the last chapter about how contractile vacuoles could squirt out excess water. Freshwater fish don't have vacuoles, but they again are sort of bathed in fresh water. Fresh water is flowing over their gills, for, you know, etc. Um, so the way that they solve the problem is they basically make lots and lots of urine. Um, it's not even urine, actually. They make ammonia. And ammonia is actually a highly toxic waste product. We make ammonia too, but because it's so toxic, we ha our cells actually use energy to change the ammonia into something called urea that's less toxic. Um, but because fish live in water, it doesn't matter that the ammonia they make is toxic. They actually use the water to their advantage. They just pee all the time, and they can flush out the toxic ammonia and not have to waste energy converting the ammonia to something else. Saltwater organisms have the opposite problem. They're living in a hypertonic environment. So plants that, that grow in the ocean, hypertonic environment, or, or fish that live in the ocean, or saltwater crocodiles that drink saltwater, they have to have some way of solving the problem. One of the ways they solve the problem is that the, the concentration of solutes that they keep in their body is actually higher than a freshwater organism. So by having a higher solute concentration inside the cell, their cells match a little better with the salt water. Uh, but in addition to that, they have mechanisms to actively excrete the extra salt. And that way, by getting rid of the extra salt, they can solve the problem. Now, plants are different. Plants, this is a contractile vacuole, plants actually don't want to be in an isotonic environment. And this is something that you should memorize. Plants actually need to be in a hypotonic solution. So water, fresh water is constantly coming in at the roots and bathing the cells. Why don't the plant cells swell up and burst? Because they have a cell wall and they have a vacuole. So a plant in a hypotonic solution is actually a healthy plant. The vacuole swells up, creates pressure on the cell wall, and now you have a healthy plant. A plant in an isotonic solution, even though animal cells need to be isotonic to their environment, plants isotonic to their environment will actually look a little wilted because without the water flowing around them and, and getting sucked up and creating the pressure on the cell wall, you, you the, the cells get a little bit limp. And if you put salt water on a plant, that would be the worst situation. Now you have a hypertonic solution. That's actually going to cause water to leave the cells. So they're not just going to be a little bit limp. They're literally going to be killed. It's called plasmolysis. We're actually going to see that in the lab on Friday where you're going to put salt water on the plant and you're actually going to see healthy plant. You can imagine the cell cytoplasm spread all the way out to the cell wall. With salt water, the whole thing shrivels up and you'll see all this empty space. So that's osmoregulation. Now, we talked about osmosis and diffusion. A third uh, type of passive transport is called facilitated diffusion. So facilitated diffusion is still moving things from higher to lower concentrations, uh, but instead of going from higher to lower concentrations through the phospholipid bilayer, they're going to higher or lower concentrations through a membrane protein. A lot of people get this wrong on the test. A lot of people think when they see facilitated diffusion, that it's, a, it's an example of active transport. In other words, that it requires energy. It does not require energy. It is passive. Um, this includes aquaporins that carry water through. This also includes ion channels that you have. 
um, and what are called carrier proteins that change shape. But the bottom line is, in a picture, if you saw substances going from higher to lower concentration, so notice higher to lower, I'll put my little arrow this way, through a protein in the membrane, that would be facilitated diffusion, and it would be passive. If you just saw the things going from higher to lower straight through the phospholipids, like here, instead of through a protein, that would be simple diffusion. Um, if it was active transport, which is what we're going to talk about next, you would be going the opposite direction. You would go from low to high, and in the picture you would actually see ATP, which is the cell's energy source. So this is a couple of pictures of facilitated diffusion. Notice the substances going through a protein from high to low. In the first case, it's a channel, meaning it, it just sort of holds its shape. In the second case, it's called a carrier. You don't have to know the difference. But the, the molecule, when it goes in, it sort of causes the protein to change shape. Notice no ATP in the picture. Um, this is called a gated channel because it can open and close. And this is a little animation. It's not very good, but it's also showing facilitated diffusion, how these little blocks are going from high to low through a protein. So active transport's the opposite. Active transport is where the cell uses energy to pump things against their gradient. So ATP is required for this, and that means you might actually see mitochondria in areas where, uh, where this is going on. Um, going back for a second, this, um, again, in a picture, you would probably see ATP, and I'll show you a picture momentarily. This is a little animation. Notice what's happening here. ATP binds. When it binds, what it actually does is it drops off a phosphate. Notice in this picture. Um, that's because the T is for tri. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It loses a phosphate and becomes an adenosine diphosphate. And this phosphate hooking here is what causes the protein to change shape. So if you see a picture and ATP is in there, in that picture, or the word energy, like in this picture where you see the word energy, that would tell you immediately that this is an example of active transport. Um, now, the most common example of active transport, or just showing that animation one more time, is what's called the sodium potassium pump. Every cell has the sodium potassium pump. The bottom line is, what does it do? It is, a, it is an active transport pump. It pumps three sodium ions out, two potassium ions in, and it requires one ATP to do that. This is sort of the overview. Honestly, if you can remember this, you could probably answer most any question you were asked about the sodium potassium pump. Now, they're going to show it to you in six separate pictures. So I'm going to walk you through the six pictures. But remember, going back, three sodiums are going to get pumped out of the cell. And technically, there's already a high concentration of sodium outside. So this is going against the gradient. Two potassiums are going to get brought in, and it's going to require one ATP. So let's walk through it very quickly. So step one, three sodiums bind to this protein. Step two, ATP comes in and drops off a phosphate. What that's going to do is it's going to cause this protein to change its shape. So look at the next slide. Now our protein has changed its shape, and it's not attracted to the sodium anymore. So the sodiums leave. Now, because the sodiums have left, the new protein shape is attracted to potassium. So notice three sodiums went out. Now, two potassiums are going to bind. And when the two potassiums bind, that causes that phosphate that the ATP left on there to leave. And when the phosphate leaves, the protein is going to go back to its original shape again. And here we are in our next slide. The phosphate left. The protein returns to its original shape, and the phosphates now, I'm sorry, the potassiums are released. So again, going back to the overall thing, three sodiums got pumped out, two potassiums got pumped in, and the driving energy force for that pump was ATP. The phosphate breaking off of ATP changed the shape of the protein to carry the things across. I believe there's a little animation. Actually, first there's a summary here. So you see on the left, diffusion. That's simple diffusion straight through the membrane. Facilitated diffusion, notice it is still an example of passive transport, carrying things high to low, but through proteins. 
and then active transport, the real clue there, if you see energy or ATP, it's active transport, but it is taking things from low to high. If you notice these little uh, diamonds are getting transported in this direction, they're going from a lower concentration to a higher concentration, so against the gradient. Here's an animation, I believe, of the sodium potassium pump. So, step one, three sodiums come in. Technically, they would not be lined up like a carnival ride. The phosphate, technically this would be ATP dropping off the phosphate. They're just showing it as a little P there. That causes the shape change, the sodiums are released. Now it's attracted to potassium. Again, they would not be waiting in line. The potassium's binding caused the phosphate to be released, which then causes the protein to go back to its original shape. So, Overall, three sodiums go out, two potassiums come in, and the breaking of ATP, that phosphate getting added, is the driving force that causes the protein to first, when it binds, change the shape to take the sodiums out, as you can see right now. And now, when the potassiums bind and that phosphate leaves, it now turns it back to the original shape again. And so that's a very nice animation showing what's happening in the sodium-potassium pump. An electrogenic pump, oh, no, no, sorry, that's a later thing. Membrane potential is where you have a difference in voltage. It's just the definition. If you have a different charge on two sides of a membrane, it's literally called membrane potential. You're, it's really just something to memorize. Now, there's another term very similar called an electrochemical gradient. An electrochemical gradient is where you have two things that are different on the two sides of a membrane. You have a difference in electricity or charge, and you have a difference in the number of ions that you have on the two sides of a membrane. Um, and this can uh, be an important force. We'll talk later about why. But again, it's caused by two things. Number one, you have a chemical force. You have a difference in ion concentration on the two sides. The sodium potassium pump does this. You end up with more sodiums outside, and you end up with uh, potassium more inside. So you basically have a difference in sodiums and potassiums on the two sides of the membrane. That's the chemical force. But in addition to that, you also have an electrical force. Why? Because remember in the sodium-potassium pump, you pumped three sodiums out. And you only pumped two potassiums in. What does that mean? What that means is that the, in, the outside of the cell is going to have a more positive charge than the inside because you're pumping three positives out and only pumping two positives in. And so that causes what's called an electrical force. So that's called an electrochemical gradient when that is set up. It'll make more sense in other chapters because we'll talk about electrochemical gradients when we talk about the nervous system and also when we talk about cell respiration and the mitochondria. So for now, it's really a definition. Electrogenic pumps are any proteins that create this electrochemical gradient. So the sodium potassium pump is an example of one. It creates the gradient because it pumps different numbers of charges in different directions. And in plants, fungi, and bacteria, and also in mitochondria, we have what are called proton pumps. And proton pumps carry hydrogen ions, which are protons, um, through a cell. Again, it'll become more apparent why this is important later. I do have one example coming up. Um, but it, they, they basically create a, the gradient creates like a stored energy that can be used later. Um, so this is an example, a picture of a proton pump. It's just pumping hydrogens. Notice it requires energy, and it creates a gradient. You have more positives outside than inside. You also have more hydrogens outside than inside. And finally, co-transport is where two proteins work together, like cooperation. So what's happening in this picture is this pump down here carries sucrose. Now, it does not require ATP. You don't see any ATP in the picture down here. But in order for it to work, it's sort of like when you go to the carnival and they can't have, you can't be a single rider. So you have to wait for somebody to ride with you if you've ever had that situation. So sucrose can't get in unless hydrogen also binds with it. In other words, it needs two things. So this is called co-transport because since this pump here requires hydrogen in order to work, this other pump, over here pumps hydrogens out. In other words, this one that requires ATP is bringing the hydrogens over here so that they can go through. So even though this one that carries sucrose doesn't need ATP directly, if the proton pump shut down, 
This one would show.